Thank you for that uh, warm and generous welcome. I am uh, genuinely uh, grateful to the Indian Chamber for bringing together this important forum, uh, and uh, especially grateful for those of you who uh, made arrangements on relatively short notice to join us today. For, uh, what I hope is an important uh, part of the ongoing conversation about seizing this moment in the life of our state. Uh, I'm especially grateful, as so many are, to Scott Miller, uh, who uh, uh, has served in recent years as, as uh, president of the Indian Chamber, but has been involved in this organization for over five years. Scott, we thank you for your leadership. Uh, we wish you every continued success, so long as you stay in Indiana to be successful. <laughs> Join me in thanking Scott for this I'm delighted to be with the chairman of the board here at the Indian Chamber, John Thompson, who is a, uh, a man I deeply admire uh, and is a critical part of the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. John, thank you for your uh, great leadership. To others who've been mentioned, Charlie, Lisa, and uh, Bill, uh, thank you all for the hospitality today. Um, before we get to the, uh, the focus of my remarks today, uh, allow me to take a moment. Um, to uh, give all of us an opportunity to reflect uh, on the tragic events of this past month. Every Hoosier joins uh, every American in our heartfelt sorrow for the losses and the injuries that occurred uh, at the end of the Boston America. It cut very close to my family. Uh, my brother's new son-in-law had finished the Boston America one hour early. And so to receive word as we did of those events transpiring touched very close to our family. And let me just take this moment to say here in a state where we cherish our first responders and we cherish those citizens who run in when others are running out. That seeing the response of the community and the public safety community in Boston and seeing the response of volunteers who ran into the wreckage at their own peril. Convinces me of two things. We here in Indiana should continue to pray for those who have experienced loss and injury in the wake of this terrible event. But we in Indiana are proud, and a bit proud to be Americans, to see the response of those first responders and all of those brave citizens who rose to the challenge. Now on to the business at hand, which is business. Here at the Indian Chamber, uh, I came uh, just about a year ago to speak to an issue that I heard more about as I traveled around this state applying for my present job than any other. In a campaign for governor that took me to all 92 counties in Indiana, many more than once, I heard Hoosiers say that they wanted the next administration of this state to make job creation job one. And we've done that from the very outset of our administration. But it was here, before the Indy Chamber, that we took the opportunity last July to outline our economic platform. And I'm here to speak to you about the progress of that platform at a critical moment in the life of our state and in the life of the Indiana General Assembly. And to explain to each of you, in particular, why I believe the time has come to cut income taxes for every Hoosier across the board by 10% and make that reduction permanent. Now all of this comes in the wake of uh, the last 24 hours or so when we got some great news for Hoosiers and some good news for policymakers at the State House. And that was the news from the April revenue forecast. First, uh, the great news for Hoosier. Uh, our economic forecast now shows that Indiana enjoys job growth at a rate faster than 42 other states, and our economy is projected to continue to grow. In addition, the forecast showed that Hoosiers can expect job growth and falling unemployment over the next seven years, with unemployment stubbornly over 8% in the Hoosier state. I can tell you there's no community in Indiana where that's not welcome news. We also can expect our state's overall economic output to grow as well. Our economic fundamentals in this state 
are looking strong. And the revenue forecast for the state also reflects that expanding economic opportunity. But as I come before you today, let me say it is great news for Hoosier. But it's also good news for policymakers who are at this very hour and in a meeting I started at a breakfast meeting in my office this morning, we are continuing to labor diligently and in good faith to craft an honestly balanced budget that funds our priorities and provides Hoosiers with the kind of tax relief they need and deserve. But let me say that we're doing so in, in large measure because despite our positive trajectory, the people of Indiana know that our economy's growth is not matching their hopes and aspirations for greater opportunity. And that feeling is not unfounded. We have plenty of room to grow in the Hoosier State. Even though we've seen strong job growth since the depths of the recession, job growth is not as strong as we'd like. We need more high-wage, high-demand jobs in Indiana. Our per capita income stands at 86% of the national average. We continue to languish in the lower half of states when it comes to personal income. When it comes to per capita GDP growth, we're pretty much in the middle of the pack now. Our state's challenges are compounded by national trends, of course. Just last week, we learned that consumer spending is down across the board in this country and has, in fact, been worse than we thought it would be at the beginning of the year. So the reason I'm focusing today uh, on our economic agenda is to say that while we've made progress and while our economic forecast projects that we will continue to make progress in Indiana, the truth of the matter is we've got a ways to go. And I think we should seize this moment in the life of our state to enact a state budget that will make Hoosiers more prosperous and make Indiana more competitive in attracting the investment that will create jobs for today and tomorrow. And let's be very clear about the point. Indiana, I truly believe, is in a competition for jobs. States that understand the nature of that competition have the best economies in the country. They also understand the successful job creation strategy must be multifaceted and must be based on key factors that help us win that competition. Now, I've proposed a bold agenda in both my jobs budget and a series of proposals that I'll touch on briefly, all of which is designed to have Indiana meet this moment, a moment where we have gaining momentum in our economy, but a moment where we need a multifaceted approach we're seizing this opportunity to get this economy moving. And our, our, our agenda, very simply, I can outline for you, is this. First, pass an honestly balanced budget that holds the line on spending, that protects our reserves, that funds our priorities, that includes, we can seize this moment to increase funding for roads and schools. I believe that roads mean jobs, and I believe we have no higher obligation than making sure that every child in Indiana has access to a world-class education. We can meet those obligations. In addition to passing a budget that meets all these priorities, I believe, particularly in light of the revenue forecast yesterday, that we also ought to seize this moment to provide permanent across-the-board tax relief by reducing the personal income tax rate by 10%. As I mentioned, I first proposed a 10% income tax reduction before the Indy Chamber on the 31st of July, 2012. And uh, I can't imagine uh, a better week of the year, the week of April 15th, <laughs> to come in and to tell Hoosiers we have the opportunity to lower the income tax burden, and I believe we should. The other parts of our agenda, before I amplify that point any further, uh, are, uh, are, are the following. And I appreciate Scott mentioning the fact uh, that earlier this week with the bipartisan leadership of the House and Senate at my side, I managed to sign two different bills, uh, the Regional Works Council Bill and the Career Council Bill that I believe history will record. Monday was the day that Indiana decided again to make career and vocational education a priority in every high school in the state of Indiana again. In addition to our efforts on workforce, uh, I signed on my first day in office a freeze on all uh, state regulations. We enacted it on day one. Uh, cutting red tape in Indiana, and I'm pleased to report to the Indy Chamber today 
And since I signed that executive order, uh, state agencies, uh, the number of proposed regulations offered by state agencies is down 92% from last year. We're cutting red tape. As I speak to you, we have team members at the State House that are also working in a variety of other areas on, in improving our higher education system so it rewards on-time graduation and provides a clear path for our students to a four-year degree. We're working to make college more affordable, uh, ideas that have seen support in both chambers, of course, in great organizations like this. We're also working uh, to foment new collaboration between our public universities and colleges uh, and uh, our life sciences industries across the state. Uh, I truly do believe that Indiana, with our preeminent position in life sciences, can build on that by increasing collaboration between our publicly supported universities and colleges. And I believe that with the right collaboration, the establishment of an Indiana Applied Research Enterprise, Indiana can make it our goal to be number one in life sciences in the United States of America. And that's going to mean jobs. But let me focus on, on the issue of tax relief as I bring my remarks to a close. Today, as I did last summer, I made the case that I believe that tax reform, in combination, combination with an honestly balanced budget, in combination with an, with an effort to fund our priorities in roads and schools and promote greater innovation and greater affordability and greater collaboration in higher education, I truly do believe uh, that uh, the tax relief and tax reform is and must be a centerpiece of making Indiana more competitive uh, in the months and years ahead. And I think we've started an important discussion about tax reform in the state of Indiana since that day in July last year. Uh, we've had a healthy debate in the State House, not only about income tax reform, but about other forms of tax relief provisions. Let me say, for instance, that thanks to the leadership of the Speaker Brian Bosk and his team in the House, and the efforts of Senate President Pro Tem David Long, Senator Kenley, and others. Uh, there is now a growing consensus for us to end once and for all the inheritance tax in Indiana, and I support this. I believe that efforts to hasten the day that inheritance tax is a part of Indiana's history and not present should be a part of any final budget agreement. Simply put, death should not be a taxable event, and we ought to make sure this is a part of any outcome in this session of the General Assembly. But regarding my initial proposal for income tax relief, let me say that much of the debate uh, over the last several months has centered on whether we can afford a 10% reduction in the income tax. And yesterday's revenue forecast in addition to showing great news for Hoosiers and the promise of economic growth for our state, also showed good news for policymakers. As you may have read in the newspapers this morning or seen in various news outlets, uh, our revenue forecast showed $290 million more in expected revenues over the next 27 months. But one thing is clear in the wake of this revenue forecast. Because of sound fiscal stewardship in recent years, we can afford to fund our priorities, including increases in roads and schools, and give Hoosiers the kind of permanent tax relief that they need and deserve in these difficult economic times. And I'm determined to make that a reality. But a larger question, though, beyond whether we can afford income tax relief, and where I'd like to close my remarks today is simply this, whether or not we can afford not to pass income tax relief. I mean, truthfully, when you look at the competition for jobs all across this country and all across the world, it's actually accurate to say that where all the competition is happening these days in the policy realm is in the fight over income taxes, income taxes reduction and relief. And there's a reason for that. In, in today's competitive national and global economy, it is uh, income taxes that have been the focal point of of economic growth and analysis in recent years. Now we've, we've demonstrated in our budget that we can afford it because our fiscal situation is strong. And there are arguments for it. 
Uh, I've made these in many other venues, and I'll make them again today. By reducing income taxes by 10% across the board, we'll leave dollars in the pockets of working Hoosiers, but we'll leave $500 million in our economy. A second, it's also, it's never a matter of whether or not the money gets spent. It's always a matter of who spends it. And I will tell you, as a cheerful conservative, that I will always believe that everyday Hoosiers will spend their hard-earned dollars more wisely, more efficiently, and more productively than anyone in government ever will. So I believe in that. Thirdly, as John Thompson and I were chatting just a few minutes ago, many of the small businesses that are represented here today, many who just paid their quarterly installment under federal income taxes that just went up also on this. The overwhelming majority of small businesses in the Hoosier State file their taxes under the individual income tax rate, so the most effective way to lower taxes on job creators is to lower the income tax rate. The argument that I want to focus mostly on today is the argument about competitiveness. Because it's imperative that we in Indiana understand that lowering the income tax rate, in addition to everything else on our agenda, will first and foremost make Indiana more competitive in the competition for jobs and investment in our state. Here's some of the backdrop of what's happening. There are nine states in this country with no income tax. Those nine states experienced job growth at nearly 26% above the national average over the past decade. Tax policy has a direct effect on where entrepreneurs, companies, and families decide to locate. And right now, it's almost inarguable. States with a more favorable income tax are scooping up investment in jobs that could just as easily become the their state. Secondly, a hard fact, we are a net exporter of talent in India. According to Ball State, we rank 44th nationally in the percentage of our population with college degrees, despite ranking 14th in degrees conferred. That means other states are providing better employment options for college graduates than we are. A Patel study attributes this to a disquieting decline in the number of high-skilled occupations in Indiana over the past decade, but it really is ultimately about jobs and opportunities in the overall climate for Hoosiers. And despite recent progress, our tax situation actually in Indiana has gotten worse in recent years, which makes the case for additional income tax relief even more urgent. Here are the facts. According to the Tax Foundation, our overall tax burden has gone from 8.2% to 9.6% over the past decade, making us 23rd in the nation. Federal taxes, as I just mentioned, have just gone up on 53% of all business income in the state of Indiana. The payroll tax holiday, which amounts to more than $2 billion that Hoosiers will be sending to Washington, D.C., instead of spending in their local communities, spending on their families and their own priorities. The sunsetting of the payroll tax break creates an uncanny disincentive to hire, but it also takes money out of the pockets of Hoosiers. And of course, the Affordable Care Act is putting a break on economic growth. A Kelly School study last year found that our latest economic expansion that 15% of all the new jobs that have been created would have been at risk if the Affordable Care Act had been in place at the time. Since 95% of these jobs came from smaller growing firms, what this really means is that this looming federal legislation is especially bad for young startup companies and entrepreneurs, which are our job creators in the Hoosier State. As you know, uh, this was confirmed by the U.S. Chamber survey of small businesses, which found that 72% of their respondents said that the Affordable Care Act made it harder for their company to hire. To put our situation simple, and to put the challenge and opportunity that Indiana has plain, we're being squeezed on one side by the increasing pressure taxes placed on job creation, and on the other by states who competitive, whose competitive tax environments are beating us in the jobs world. To win the jobs more, Indiana must seize this moment to make our state more attractive to investment that will create jobs. And I believe that income tax relief is an essential part of the equation in doing so. We need to confront our situation head on. We need to be guided by evidence, not ideology. And we need to admit that despite all our recent successes here in Indiana, we still have work to do if we want to make Indiana even more competitive in attracting the investments that will create good paying jobs today and tomorrow. And the economic analysis of this is overwhelming. 
We'll post the elements of this speech online, and you can get all the citations for this and read them to your heart's content. But I'll give you a few examples. There's strong evidence that lowering income tax rates spurs economic growth. Economist Robert Barrow, C.J. Reddick, found that reducing income tax rates by 1% increases economic growth the following year by one half a percent in the following year. Another study by economist uh, Carol Mertens and Martin Raven demonstrates the merits of income tax reduced as follows. They found that every 1% reduction in the income tax rate generates a 1.4% increase in real GDP the following quarter and a 1.8% increase in GDP over the next three years. Clearly, reducing income taxes means more jobs. And I believe Indiana should seize this moment to make that a reality in our state. The point is this. If we want to be more competitive in today's global jobs war, we have to be in the fight over income tax relief and reform. Lowering income taxes across the board by 10% will increase our GDP. It will increase personal income. It will bring new investment and jobs to Indiana and make us more competitive to do it. So let me summarize as I close. You know, I, I said early on that I was going to make job creation job one. And we have. From the outset of this administration, on my very first day in office, I stood out there on a cold day. I raised my right hand. I walked in the office. After I had a private moment, a private prayer, I had two meetings that day. My first meeting was I met with the bipartisan leadership of the House of Senate in my office. We talked about the upcoming legislative session. The second meeting I had was with our economic development team. I've been meeting at least once a week with our entire economic development team. And I don't just mean the people at the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. We're bringing all of our resources to bear on rural development. Lieutenant Governor and the, and the whole portfolio of agencies that she's working on to create new jobs in cities large and small all across the state of Indiana. We have workforce development in the room talking about the real trends and the real challenges to make sure that our communities are work ready uh, and uh, we're making in, investments in the kind of infrastructure uh, and making communities ready to receive those businesses that are looking at the major state as we speak. And literally, every day, I'm on the phone with a CEO somewhere in this country. Uh, my team's keeping me pretty busy. And uh, those of you that know me well know that I'm really just a salesman at heart. I love getting on the phone with these CEOs that are looking at Indiana, interested in Indiana. And they already know the facts. They already know that we've got the best people in the world. Can I get some agreement on that? We know we got the best location in the country. All right. We got some of the best infrastructure in the country. Yeah, they can read the newspaper. We're going to make it better. They know Indiana's advanced education reform. Extending educational opportunities to underprivileged children more generously than any other state in the union. They know we got a triple A bond rate. And they're watching. And they know that this administration and this General Assembly are going to continue to live within our means. We're going to continue to practice fiscal responsibility. And we're going to continue to maintain the kind of balance sheet that is today and will remain the envy of the nation. We also take a note of the fact that we're making new investments in career, technical, and vocational education in Indiana. I got to tell you, the jobs announcements that I've been at since the first of the year, whether it's at Kokomo, the price was big announcement, or here in central Indiana, when Geico made their announcement, or in southern Indiana, when we cut the ribbon at the Amazon facility, or when we just cut a ribbon at Dow Agri Sciences. Everywhere I go, all of the topics that I just brought up to you and our commitment to having the best educated and the best skilled workforce in America is capturing the attention of the people that we speak. But I want to tell you, I think it's extremely important that in the midst of this moment, we add tax relief and tax reform to the equation. I think there could be no better way for us to see our commitment to fiscal responsibility, our commitment to economic growth than to stay in the fight, to be in the fight, and to win the fight for lowering the tax burden on Hoosiers and most Hoosier small businesses. I truly believe when Indiana adds a 10% income tax cut 
to one more honestly balanced budget that funds our schools and infrastructure, that protects our reserves and our top credit rating, that combined with our reputation for education reform, with workplace freedom, uh, with our commitment to cutting red tape, to improving career and vocational education, and to expanding the influence and the investment of life sciences here in the Hoosier State. When we do all of that in combination, we will put Indiana in the pole position to win the race for jobs for this generation and the next, and we will make Indiana the state that works. Thank you all very much.